Well, you reap what you sow. You brought this on yourself. You made your bed, so lie in it. You get what's coming to you. You get what you deserve. These sayings are part of our everyday speech and they impact our understanding of how the world works or maybe how the world should work. What you give to something determines what you get out of it, right? If you work hard, you'll be successful. If you make poor decisions, well, you get to deal with the poor results. In our capitalist society, we tend to see much of life this way, a series of transactions. I work, I get paid. I give money, I expect to get something in return. I make a mistake, I live with the consequences. It's all very quid pro quo, something for something. The notion that we get what we deserve seems to be embedded in the fabric of our American society, so it can be difficult for us to accept the possibility of not getting what we feel we deserve. And the opposite is true. We don't handle it well. When someone doesn't get what we think they deserve and they kind of skirt around the consequences of their bad actions. We are wrapping up a worship series called Misunderstood, where we have been examining some common sayings that get tossed around by well-meaning folks, myself included, as we try to make sense of life and faith. And today we're going to dig into this notion that you get what you deserve. But is that always true? Nah. Right? Sometimes bad things happen for no good reason. And good things come our way that we had nothing to do with. So as much as we might want to enforce the idea that you get what you deserve, we all know this statement doesn't hold up for long. Life is unfair. The world is riddled with injustice. And if we're honest, also, we receive good things we don't deserve either. There's a Christian rock band called the Newsboys. It's been around a long time. And way back in the day, in 1994, um, they released a song called Real Good Thing. Here's the chorus, which I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to say it to you. Okay, here's the chorus. When we don't get what we deserve, that's a real good thing. A real good thing. When we get what we don't deserve, that's a real good thing. A real good thing. These lyrics are rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This good news that as sinful people, we don't get what we deserve, right? It's punishment for that sin. And what we do get from God is something we don't deserve salvation and eternal life. These ideas are summed up in two words foundational to our Christian faith, mercy and grace. When we don't get what we deserve, that's mercy. And that's a real good thing. When we get what we don't deserve, that's grace. And that's a real good thing. The passage we just heard from Ephesians 2, it paints a before and after picture of God's mercy and grace in action. Paul, the writer of Ephesians, says, We were as good as dead, walking in the sinful ways of the world. But God loved us too much to leave us like the walking dead, lost and separated from God. Even though we deserved the full brunt of God's judgment, God chose another way. We did not get what we deserved. Ephesians 2, 3 says, We were by nature children of wrath. Not real comforting news. This means we deserve punishment for our sin. We deserve God's wrath. And as uncomfortable as it can be to talk about the wrath of God, this is a huge theological concept, and, and it's one that deserves some careful study. For now, I want to offer maybe a Cliff's Notes version of what God's wrath means in our theology. 
we generally understand wrath as like this intense anger that's seeking something or someone to punish. And again, in our capitalist society, we might admit that sometimes we believe people are deserving of such punishing anger. You get what you deserve. But to understand what it means for God to express punishing anger, we first have to understand the character of God. God is holy and just. God always does what is right and fair. And because God is holy and just, God is concerned with holiness and justice. God is loving. God cares about people and how they are treated. So God's wrath is God's just, God's right and fair response to grave injustices against human beings. When people are oppressed, when weak people are exploited so that powerful people can gain more for themselves, this offends God's sense of justice. It makes God angry when humans made in God's image are abused. This theme permeates our scriptures, and we consistently see God working for restorative justice, the kind of justice that makes things right for those who have been wronged. And this is good news, because it assures us that when injustice is perpetrated in our world, we can trust that God will handle it. God will not allow injustice to have the last word. But the accompanying difficult truth with that is that each of us has done injustice. Each of us has been arrogant. Each of us has misused power. Each of us has abused another person with our words or actions. Well, that makes us deserving of God's wrath. And that's the bad news that leads up to a two-word hinge in Ephesians 2.4 that changes everything. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy, saved us from this wrath. Through Jesus Christ, God has made it possible for us to walk in a new way in the good works that God intended to be our way of life, to turn from the ways of the world that would coerce us into abusing others for our own gain or exploiting the weak. God has saved us from ourselves. God has saved us from God's own righteous judgment through the work of Jesus Christ. We did not get what we deserved. You know, because of our sinful condition and our proclivity towards living unjustly, it is pretty fascinating that Paul didn't write, um, you know, you are children of wrath and God is rich in wrath. Right? He didn't say that. God is rich in mercy. And this is the good news. God sees the potential of humanity to do what is right, to turn from evil and seek what is good. This is why God is so patient with us. This is why God is patient with our enemies. God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, rich in mercy. When we don't get what we deserve, that's a real good thing. And the scripture teaches us that this is all a gift because there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn the merciful love of God. It is not our own doing, but the work of God that saves us from sin and hopelessness. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't trade for it. There's no quid pro quo offer that would make us deserving of the immeasurable riches of God's kindness. God freely gives what we don't deserve. And because we're steeped in this something for something mindset, sometimes we can get mixed up, believing that maybe we can be good enough to earn God's favor. Maybe we can do enough good things to balance out the bad things we've done. Maybe we could find a way to tip those scales in our favor, but it doesn't work that way. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Throughout the New Testament, we encounter this truth that no one is righteous enough to earn salvation. No one can do enough good things to make themselves right with God. Instead, it is God's righteousness, God's good works that save us. Our action is to trust that that's enough. And then, yes, in response to those gifts, we live out our gratitude and our commitment to God by doing the good things God created us to do. There's no earning God's favor. There's no deserving God's love. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And hear this. There's nothing you need to undo to make God love you more. God's love is already here. Even when we were dead in our sin, God loved us with the greatest love. When you get what you don't deserve, that's a real good thing. Now, one thing I think we need to be careful of, especially in the church, is the misuse of grace or using grace as an excuse to deny justice. We all know that sadly there are many stories in the church where people in powerful positions have mistreated those in their care. And when that sin is brought to light, often the expectation is that the victim should extend grace to their abuser. In other words, forgive and forget and show grace to the person who hurt you. Now, of course, we believe in forgiveness and grace, but let us not forget God cares about justice. So that old saying, you get what you deserve, this can be true in the sense that we do experience the consequences of our actions and so do the people around us. Like if I get angry and I start throwing punches, let's go, right? Sure, there's forgiveness and grace for me, but the person I hurt is still bleeding. We cannot cheapen grace to dismiss the ill effects of our bad choices. God calls us to repent from our sin, to restore what we have damaged, and to seek reconciliation. And sometimes that involves the kind of justice that costs us something. Many of you know that I've done a little bit of prison ministry, and it is interesting to talk about God's grace with incarcerated women, women who are doing time for the crimes they committed. And while they learn to accept the free grace of God that washes away their sin and offers them a fresh start, they also realize at the very same time that those sins, those mistakes, that rule breaking led to very real, very tangible justice. So both things can be true at once. We can experience God's grace and mercy while at the same time experiencing the consequences of our bad choices and doing our part to make things right. That means turning away from the sin that robs us and others of life to instead walk in the life-giving ways of Jesus. Perhaps you have seen the musical Les Miserables, <laughs> Les Mis, either on stage or on screen. If you read the 1,400-page book, I mean, kudos to you, Marge. Not yet? Okay. It's hefty. The story is set in France in the early 1800s, and the main character, Jean Valjean, had been imprisoned for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving family. Upon his release, he was given a yellow card, which he had to present to others to announce his sinful past. This card made sure he carried his shame and guilt with him everywhere. It also prevented him from finding shelter and food and employment because who would trust a criminal? One evening, he came upon the home of a bishop who, even after learning of Valjean's status as an ex-convict, invited him inside, out of the cold, where he could rest and enjoy a bit of bread and wine. 
That's grace. But then, under the cover of darkness, Jean Valjean decided to take his leave. And believing there was no future for him but to live into his identity as a criminal, he also took with him the bishop's silverware. Out on the run, he was eventually caught by the police, and he lied to them, telling them the bishop had given him the silverware as a gift. So the police marched Jean Valjean back to the bishop's house, where certainly the truth would prevail and he would be sent back to prison. Nineteen years for a loaf of bread, how much more for a collection of silver? But standing trial that night, Jean Valjean and the police were surprised by the bishop's response. Not only did he go along with the story that the silverware had been a gift, he went overboard, saying to Jean Valjean in front of the police, my friend, you left so early, you forgot the candlesticks. And the bishop gave to Jean Valjean the last of his earthly treasures, saving him from the punishment he deserved and equipping him with what he needed to begin again. That's mercy. If you know the story, you know that this was the pivotal moment, the but God hinge that changed Jean Valjean. He was touched by the grace and mercy of God extended to him by the bishop. And in that moment, he determined to escape the whirlpool of his sin, leaving the old Jean Valjean behind, declaring another story must begin. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God is rich in mercy. God has rewritten the story, transformed us from death to life, and saved us by grace. May we not only receive these gifts with grateful hearts, but also share them generously with all of God's children. For this is what God continues to do for us even when we don't deserve it. Let us pray. Merciful God, we cannot begin to thank you enough for transforming us from death to life. You have given us so much more than we deserve, and we are grateful. Help us not to hoard these gifts for ourselves, but to freely share your mercy and grace. In the name of Christ, amen.